From Sarasota Memorial and the Deb Kavanaugh Multimedia Studio, this is HealthCast, a healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everyone. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about ADHD and its management. Our guest today is Dr. Azima Khan, a pediatrician with First Physicians Group in Venice. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me here. Dr. Khan, can you first start with a brief overview of what exactly ADHD is? So ADHD is an abbreviation for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And it's a neurodevelopmental condition uh, which has both genetic and environmental causes. Um, the hallmark of the condition is impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity. And these symptoms have to be inconsistent with the developmental age of the person or the child who's being evaluated. So it's developmentally inconsistent. Also, um, the core symptoms um, cause issues with developmental attainment of the regular milestones as in academics, um, in fine motor skills, in adaptive and social skills. So that is what ADHD is. At what age do you typically begin to see the signs of ADHD and how and when is it typically diagnosed? Okay, so one of the things is a lot of children could appear impulsive, they can appear inattentive, they can appear to be on the go all the time. But a lot of these um, symptoms are sometimes developmentally age appropriate and it's not a disorder. Most of the time, children are diagnosed um, between the age of 4 to 12. Previous to that age, um, the attention span, let's say a normal attention span for a two-year-old is typically three to six minutes of how old they are. So it's a six-minute attention span on anything they are um, trying to achieve. For a kindergartner, it's 15 minutes if we look at that. So a lot of these children present with either academic failure or having problems with their behavior. And that's how they come to us. The diagnosis is multifactorial, meaning you have to look at the circumstances. Um, if their symptoms are causing issues with their functioning, which is academic situation or in social situations. So if it's causing issues with uh, functioning in those areas where it is maladaptive as compared to what it should be, if the symptoms are lasting more than six months, um, and there are other factors associated, then a battery of tests are run, including questionnaires um, that are then uh, scored and seen how those symptoms are presenting. Also, it's taken into account if the child um, has any learning disabilities or there are other factors that are associated with the condition. So there, it's, it's not a diagnosis that you you know, pick out of your pocket, but it is something that has a methodology behind it. And there are questionnaires from school, from teachers, from parents that are evaluated, uh, patient's history and social um, situation is evaluated, and then you come to that diagnosis. How does ADHD differ from ADD? Not much of a difference. So uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder has three main types. So ADD is attention deficit disorder, where you don't see the hyperactivity part. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity, then you add the, the, uh, the hyperactivity part to it. And then in some children in which you won't have the inattention and only hyperactivity. So most common is the ADHD. Um, ADD or just the hyperactivity part is not as common. Sometimes um, you will see that in girls, they are more inattentive. So they don't get diagnosed with the ADHD part, but that's how they present is more, more with inattention. Are other medical conditions associated with ADHD? Not really. So there's an association of ADHD with other medical conditions as such. Children with ADHD have a normal IQ. So there is no um, developmental delay as such, except because it is uh, not age appropriate. And if they don't attain those milestones and they do not do uh, well academically, then they start, start to fall behind. But there are a lot of conditions that can be misdiagnosed or is misconstrued as ADHD. Like if a child has sensory pro uh, processing disorders, 
uh, if a child has some kind of a learning disability, if the social circumstances are not providing them the adequate stimulation, or if the child is too bright and they're not being adequately challenged. Um, and there are other things that are associated with a little bit older children, if they're depressed, if they're anxious, and they're not able to concentrate. Um, substance abuse, so you know, the different, um, what you call as uh, differentials for it, but it is not as such associated with it. But there are risk factors as pre being at preterm, uh, maternal drug abuse or smoking. Um, so those are the risk factors that are there and sometimes we see in, in uh, these children. There are a lot of myths though about ADHD and, and many parents who hear the diagnosis worry they did do something wrong. What causes ADHD? So again, there is no single cause of ADHD. As we said, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. So these children, the brain functioning and the chemical imbalance is there, which causes the areas of the brain that help with impulse control, with activity and paying attention. Uh, the neurotransmitters are not working as well in those areas. Either there's a deficiency or there's some insensitivity to that. Other um, thing is it's not bad parenting that causes ADHD, but it is an inherent um, biochemical imbalance. There is 70% family history involved in it. So if there is a family member with ADHD, there is a 70% chance of having other family members having ADHD symptoms. So yes, there is a genetic component, but there are no single gene which is identified with it. And then about 10 to 40% of the variance in ADHD is environmental factors, the social factors and the situations. Other parents worry when they hear the diagnosis of ADHD that it's not a real diagnosis. Mm -hmm. how, how do you explain this to them in a way that they understand this is very real? Sure, so um, I think parents, think that there is a conspiracy where every kid is being uh, labeled with ADHD. Um, at school, let's say they think teachers are not wanting or willing to deal with children who have a little bit more active um, you know, attitude and, and they're being labeled and being labeled is a bad thing. Uh, also, when they start looking into how it strains the relationship with a child, how it stresses them at home and at school, and how these children are being told all the time, no, don't do this. Why are you doing that? Sit down. I mean, how, how they perceive what's going on around them, they'll be able to definitely recognize that these children have these symptoms, and it is causing not only stress in the house and at school, but also socially, these children get ostracized or they start getting where they don't, can't make friends and they can't sustain friendships. So these are the things that the parents will see. And, and it's not just the academic part, but it's the social part as well for these children. Is it true that girls are diagnosed less than boys? Yes, and, and the incidence is also less in girls and, um, and we can't explain why, but girls are diagnosed less also because they're only inattentive. So by the time they come into play, Let's say by third grade, there are standardized testing for, grade, as for schools, and they want to perform well for that. And so a lot of children will go, or especially girls, will go undiagnosed until coming to that point. And then that comes up because they are not hyperactive. They're not running off the walls. Um, they're just inattentive, but they're quieter. Is there a typical age? So if girls are getting diagnosed later, is there a typical age you see diagnosis in boys or a more common age? Um, it varies. So we have some families who children at age three have significant um, disorder symptoms, but obviously you're not diagnosing them at that age because it's just too early to, to say, you know what, this is definitely not age appropriate, but there are kids who are with the family history, with bouncing off the walls, the parents are not able to sleep, the kids are up all night. So there are a lot of things going on. Yeah. 
That being said, can you talk about the importance of getting that diagnosis early on when symptoms do develop or start interfering so that you can help with development long term? Yes. So it is really important not to delay the diagnosis as such because not everything is based around medicating these patients because parents are most worried about the medication part. But if you diagnose early enough, there are a lot of behavior modifications that you can do. You can provide help at school, extended times, more individual attention. So these kids don't develop the maladaptive behavior that are then hard to unlearn later on in life. So it's really important in that. Other thing is that children start getting discouraged if they are failing at stuff, they're going to give up and they do not want to continue with school. A lot of times school refusal comes into play. A lot of times more behavior problems come into play because you cannot explain their behavior and then they get discouraged or they act out. You did just mention some management strategies. Are there non-pharmacologic ways to manage ADHD? Yes. So... Basically, the cornerstone of management is, is also multimodal. So you have children where the first thing is definitely psychosocial intervention, and that is behavior management. So the psychosocial intervention is also linked to how old they are, how much their understanding is, and also educating the parent to help with behavioral modifications and continuing strategies at home that can help the child, having routines and schedules. So those are very helpful. Other things um, is classroom assistance. Again, more one-to-one and more time to do their assignments and then positive reinforcement. So you're reinforcing the good behaviors instead of paying attention to the bad ones. Um, So those will be the non-pharmacological management. For ADHD. Are there any um, like natural supplements or anything that you recommend yes. to parents? So, so there are a lot of studies on uh, natural supplements being the answer to it. There are a lot of parents who spend a lot of money on getting these supplements and giving it to the children and seeing if their behavior will change. So there are no proven natural supplements, but the crux of the matter is that you have to provide these children with a good, well-balanced nutritional diet avoid processed food, and avoid too much simple carbs or sugars in their diet because that does cause a high and a low effect in them. Also, which is important is that um, if there are correctable causes like anemia because they can cause fatigue, tiredness, lack of concentration, that should be corrected. Vitamin D deficiency is very common in our population and that should be looked into and corrected if it is um, there. And the supplements which kind of are... Um, overall help with the well-being, again, are vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, but it is not a cure or a treatment for ADHD. Is exercise important when treating ADHD? It is very important. So these children, because they have so much pent-up energy, it is important to get them to release that energy. So a lot of times in schools, we see, oh, this kid, because he didn't complete his work, he doesn't have recess. They take away the recess of a child who has ADHD. It is worse than putting them, you know, into something where they can release that energy, come back to class, and they're ready to learn again. Um, So it is really important. And then um, also sometimes activities or exercise or group activities can teach them how to interact with other people, how to follow rules. martial arts like taekwondo or karate because it teaches them to work with people at their own pace. Sometimes they're really good. Or any 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 kind of sport which is a group sport can help, but they have to learn those skills of communicating, waiting for their turn, and respecting others. Do parents need to take a child who's diagnosed with ADHD to any kind of specialist? Not necessarily. So the basic diagnosis can be made with their pediatrician. And I would recommend actually because your pediatrician knows your child since they're born or they know them for a long period of time. So the initial evaluations need to be done in a pediatric home office. And if there are concerns that the pediatrician finds, if there are concerns about 
doing more psychoeducational evaluation to assess for learning disabilities um, or to assess for other psychological issues, anxiety, depression, or conduct disorder and sometimes oppositional disorders that can coexist with ADHD, then they will be given appropriate referrals and, and management. So we've talked about the non-pharmacologic treatments yes. for ADHD, yes. mm -hmm. but often medication does play a role in yes. treating ADHD. Yes. So what medications might be used? So the medications that are used for ADHD are um, put into two main groups. So one is called the stimulant medications, and the other are non-stimulant medications. As a first line of treatment for ADHD, stimulant medications are preferred because they have a quick um, action, mechanism of action, and they start working right away. Also, you can titrate them much better, and you can watch for side effects and um, the effect on the child and the family as such and they can be worked with much quicker. The non-stimulant medications, on the other hand, take a few weeks to build in the system, and uh, they are not as a first-line therapy because some of the symptoms may or may not be as well controlled uh, with these medications. And then there are adjuvant medications that are added to, depending on if children with ADHD may have sleep issues to begin with or other things going on. Are there risks associated with taking these medications? Yes, all medications have risk, even when you take a Tylenol or an aspirin or an Advil. So none of these medications should be taken lightly, neither are they taken lightly by the pediatrician. So we do not like to give children medications unless the benefits are much, much more than the risks associated. So there are some common side effects uh, when children are started um, on these medications, it involves a obviously a full physical examination, a risk assessment. And then when the medicines are started, we go over the common side effects as appetite. Suppression is one of the side effects. Um, sometimes some children become more nervous or anxious. Um, palpitations could be another side effect, and high blood pressure could be another side effect. So all these things are monitored things. And whenever children are started on medications, they are started at the lowest dose possible. And then it's titrated according to where the risk of the medication is here and the benefits are up here. So what are the benefits of the medication that then outweigh the risks that would result in a physician like yourself yes. prescribing them? So so depends on what symptoms the patient is coming in with. So let's say if it is more um, academic underachievement. So the, ch the child is going to be able to focus better at school pay attention to the teacher, able to assimilate the information, make it into something where he can recall it, and then it becomes a memory. So the memory doesn't develop just somebody saying something to me. So I have to have to recall it to make it a memory. So when these children are not paying attention, those memories are not being made, and they're not able to recall. So that's one part. Other part is social when they start having more friends because now they're able to sit down and reciprocate somebody's feelings and can understand and listen to somebody. And they're able to make friends and now they're, they are not being where they can't sit at um, lunch with anybody else because nobody wants to sit with them or nobody wants to play with them because they get abrupt. So so depends on what you're looking at. So those are the benefits. And you want learning experience for children to be something they enjoy and they grow with it, and they, they love to learn. But if you give them bad experience, they just shy away from it. So, so it depends on what you are treating and what you're looking for in their symptoms. What is the most important thing you want to say to parents after their child is diagnosed with ADHD? Okay, so I think the most important thing for them to know is that them, parents are advocates for the children, and so are their pediatricians. So seek help. And the pediatrician will work with you and be comfortable with what your concerns are. So if you don't want to medicate your child, nobody's going to force you to medicate your child. But there are things available, which is behavioral modifications, where you can try things and see how your child responds to it. Again, medications, any of these medications that we use for ADHD are not habit-forming. So they don't have withdrawals effects. 
they can be taken only on school days if you want to. They don't have to be taken on weekends if their ac academics is not an issue. So it really depends. You can modify. You can work with your pediatrician and get your child to have the best experience of being in school and at home and decrease the stress overall. We discussed before that there are yeah. a lot of myths yeah. surrounding ADHD. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that so many parents just think that it's just being diagnosed for every child. Mm -hmm. How common is it actually? Well, it is about 8 to 10 percent of school-age children um, will be diagnosed with this. And it could be even more. So what is interesting is it's um, diagnosed more in Caucasian population as compared to African Americans and Hispanics. That could be also due, you know, could be because of access of care, how things are being presented. <coughs> but I think the normal variants um, in behavior are out there as well. Um, there are a lot of sensory processing issues out there as well. So there's a combination of things going on. Um, but it is about 8 to 10 percent of school-age children, yes. Is there anything else you want the community to know? Well, I think the most important thing you can do for your child is to have a medical home. A pediatric office is a medical home for your children. They are your advocates there for you. I don't think you serve your children well if you just take them in for physical student urgent care or just go in for a sports physical somewhere or just go in for just sick visits off and on in different places. I think having a medical home gives the child and the family the support they need to succeed in life. So I think that is really important. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for answering all the questions today and for joining us. As always, we encourage everyone in the community to visit smh.com to get the latest information from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.